So good morning, everybody. This is House Ways and Means, and it is uh, Thursday, February 17th. And because it's Thursday, we're going to spend uh, a good part of the time on education, finance, restructuring, and Emily's going to run the meeting. Um, but before we launch into that, let me just see if anybody has any announcements or questions about what's going on today. Uh, Caleb isn't feeling great, so he's not going to be with us today. I don't know if he'll be, uh, uh, hopefully he might join us, but uh, he may watch instead. So whatever whatever he does is fine. Um, anything else anyone has? I think Pat's here because I see his glasses. Yes, right? he's just will be here. Okay. Um, all right. Thanks. Go ahead. <laughs> um, here we are back at education finance restructuring with... Deb and Catherine and Julia and Jim again. Um, thanks for coming on this journey. Um, so we're gonna, last week we looked at the numbers for what transitions would look like for communities if we were to implement weights or cost equity. And this week and the week before that, we talked about the um, moving to an income-based education tax as could be as part of the transition, it could be a separate conversation, however you like to work it in your brain. Um, and so we're gonna go back to Deb again to talk about some more details of what moving to an income-based education tax might look like, because she's been able to model the numbers, I think for the first time. And so um, it's pretty fun and interesting to look at. And so with that, I'll really just turn over to Deb. We have documents on our site um, for her to talk us through. And I'm excited to look at some of this all modeled out and think about it. Deb, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'm Deb Brighton, consultant to Joint Fiscal Office. And so we covered before sort of the basic gist of um, changing um, what we're calling, or what, what Representative Kornheiser called the income model, but actually, we've decided to call it the resident education tax, um, just so that it's clear when we're talking about the education tax and that it's separate from the personal income tax. And um, so what? So all that I'm going to show you is the change in what is now the house site portion of education finance. And um, so that means that I'm going to show you um, charts only involving that change, holding everything else constant, and that at this point, we're applying this only to replace the house site tax. So therefore, it's only on owners, homeowners. Um, eventually, we would like to apply it to renters too, but we don't have enough data to figure out how to do that at this point. So. Um, Deb, can you, before you jump into that, can you share, when you say holding everything else constant, um, can you share some of the bigger things that are held constant when we're looking at this? That's helpful for me to sort of see where this fits into the big picture. Okay, so all of the money going into the education fund is the same. All right, we haven't changed the non-residential tax or the sales tax or the... Um, lottery or any of the things that go into the education fund. So we are only taking the same amount of money that's currently raised on the house site tax and rearranging it. We also ran this without changing the um, education spending in any of the districts. And we're similarly raising the revenue based on a yield. Um, to be Brigham compliant, essentially. It's the same principle that we have now that every district would have this access to a common tax base, essentially. Um, but in this case, the, um, the link for the taxpayer is between adjusted gross income as opposed to the value of their house site. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Uh, um, one more question. Yeah, I, I have a, qu a question. Just before you started, you said something about not including renters yet. Is that 
mean that they're not in the model or that the recommendation is that we do this, but don't deal with renters? Um, they're not in the model yet. And so the recommendation at this point, the bills that have been introduced are to just change from the residential house site tax to an income tax, and then to look at extending the tax to renters and then also um, having a rental credit. Thanks. That, that's not in the bill. Um, the, it, it is in the bill to figure out a way to get, get there, but it is not in the bill to change the renter portion at this point. Yeah, I'm gonna probably shouldn't ask this right now, but I'm wondering if you, if you are going to be showing us anything that shows us, like if everybody in a town had the exact same value house um, versus a town and no renters, versus a town where some people have a high, high, you know, have, have a, a, a whole smorgasbord of, of um, people living at renters, 250 houses, you know, $500,000 houses, to just see um, how that plays out. I'm just wondering about that. Carol, can we see, is it okay with you if we see what we have and then see yeah. what we still want from there? That's a good idea. Okay. You sure? But those, yes, okay. but I'm just okay. saying that. But write it down because those are really, I want to make sure that we do All right. that if they don't have that. Thank you. Uh, Deb, just a moment ago, you, I think I heard you say it was not in the bill. And I'm not, I was wondering, is there, are you referring to an actual bill in the Senate or? Is, did you mean something else? Um, so there are two bills. I've, um, I'm more familiar with the Senate one, which is 212. And the House bill is 388, maybe. I'm sorry, I don't know exactly the number. And I don't, I don't know if we're, I, I'm not thinking of this as working off a specific bill. I'm thinking of this as sort of building out models to see what it looks like and then figure out what details need to be woven in or out. And so, um, yeah. Yeah, Scott. I just, just want to make a point about this first graph that's on the table right now. That yield is, um, it's not an apples to apples comparison necessarily what we do now with yields for income because the income yield now, we divide the yield into the district per pupil spending and then we multiply by two. So, <laughs> so this is not really, so in the other system, we multiply the, the, the quotient by two. This one, we don't. I so, love that. that, that makes sense to you. Yeah, so, so basically, <laughs> think of it this way. If you're comparing it to the current system, it's like a yield of twice that amount, really. Right. Can, it's just yeah. an important point to make. <laughs> so it should really be Wait, 3,000? Deb, can you explain no. what Scott was saying or expound on what Scott was saying in some way? <laughs> well, he's exactly right. <laughs> um, and I think that if you looked at the yield and saw that it was so low, um, if you had a math head, you would freak out and think that tax rate's going to go way up. Um, but in reality, it's very close to what the um, income yield is currently. So the rates are very close to what the income rates are. And while they may currently, and while that may seem like, oh, that's logical, we're doing exactly the same thing. Um, I was sort of stunned because... Sorry. 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 So might be might be there's a phone Caleb number Caleb. asking to come in. Uh, maybe it's Caleb. Perhaps. Sorry, Deb, we're having Zoom. We're having a Zoom moment. Just, just a quick question about who's trying to come in. Yeah, oh. that's, that's Caleb. Yes. Okay. Right. Come in. Caleb's going to join us via right. phone. So there's going to be a second of transition. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, just give us one second. Caleb, hi. <laughs> Hi, sorry, I was trying to mute. <laughs> I, uh, okay. I'm learning my again. <laughs> yeah, we're glad to have you. Um, and uh, we've just started, so you haven't missed much. And so we're on the very first page of the charts that Deb has shared with us on our honor committee page, and she's about to take us 
start taking us through them unless someone else has framing. Okay. Deb, back to you. Okay. On Great. the yield. All right. So on the first page, just on the top, it's showing that we're, we're calculating the rate exactly the same way that we currently do. We take the spending per pupil, we divide by the yield, and you come up with a tax rate. The difference is, as Representative Beck pointed out, that we're not dividing, I mean, we're not multiplying by two, which we do under current law. So it's just straightforward. Um, and so it still works that different districts will have different rates based on their spending per pupil. Deb, why do we multiply the income yield by two? Um, because eons ago, um, we had a, a base rate, I think it was a, a property rate of $1.10, and we sort of needed to set up an income rate that was kind of equivalent. And I actually couldn't remember this, but Jack Hoffman told me that he thought we set 2% um, because we kind of looked at what lower, uh, let's see, what higher income households were spending as a percent of their income and decided to set it there. Um, it was, an, it, miraculously, we're coming out with a very similar yield now, and the rates would be very similar to that, but it was never calculated based on the total population. The 2% was never calculated based on looking carefully at the total population and making sure that they would bring in the right amount to fill the the ed fund. Um, so it's it's something of a, it was a good guess. I, I can add a little bit there too. When Act 46 went through, there was conversation about that item, that topic. And um, we it was decided to leave it times two because that left the income yield and the property yield at close to the same level. Yeah, yeah. And we thought, oh my God, if we have one really low and one really high, that would make our incredibly complex system even more this un not understandable than it is already <laughs> to voters. So it's a way of having them look comparable. Yeah. In fact, they're not really. Yes. That makes sense. <laughs> Thank you. That makes sense to me. Okay. So anyway, but it was more, um, let's see, arbitrary at the time. And so the yield now is calculated to bring in exactly the right amount into the Ed Fund. And luckily, they are pretty close. <laughs> um, so uh, so the chart down at the bottom is just to illustrate two points about um, what happens here. One is that you see that the height of the bars is different in one district than another, depending on the spending per pupil, the same way that it is now. The other thing that's important to notice is that um, all the way through, through every single income category along the bottom, the height of the bar is the same um, in, within that district. In other words, the, the rate as a percentage of your income is gonna be the same for every person in, within that district, except for the people making less than 50,000. And that's where we have sort of a ramp up to replace the circuit breaker. So, um, Going to the second chart, this is basically just showing you where there's a change then <clears throat> between the resident education tax and current law. And so what you see is the purple bars of the resident education tax. And we're looking at the tax um, as a percentage of income in each of the household income categories. And as in the first chart, for the resident education tax, it's flat. Everybody's paying the same percentage of their income. But current law, you can see, is not flat. That people were paying a different percentage of their, um, of their income. And um, when I'm looking at current law, what I'm looking at is the net tax that people paid on their house site. So what is happening in current law is that first you pay on your property tax, and then you get a credit afterwards um, 
based on your income. And it only goes, it's sort of, and it has these various bumps in it, but anyway, by about 135,000 or so 140,000, um, you're not on that system and you're just paying based on property. So that you can see at the higher incomes, paying on property is, ends up being a lower percentage of your income than it would be if you were paying on your income. Okay, does that make sense so far? I just have a quick question. Why is there that little bump between the 850 and 900,000? Um, this is actual data. Yes. And so there can be strange things going on. It's like small numbers. Yeah. yeah, just somebody has a really <laughs> low house <laughs> value. Or, yeah. or um, I should also point out that we were, I'm showing these as household income category. We collect household income data from people who file for the credit. Um, and our idea is to change to just a gross income. So we don't have a household income uh, file number for people who have high incomes now, unless it just happens that their software filled in that sheet. So where there isn't, wasn't a household income um, number filled in and where the AGI is greater than 135,000, I substituted AGI for household income here. Um, but where you see those blips, it may be the act somebody actually had a very low house value or they filled out the form incorrectly. <laughs> something like that. It's just, it's the actual data coming in there. Sure. Um, so thank you, Deb. Uh, Janet stole one of my two questions. My other <laughs> question was that, that um, the, the way I'm reading this chart, if, if the purple bar is higher, then you are paying more at you know, that income level. And so, you know, as, as your income goes up, you're paying more than you would be for the, the property tax. But why down at 50 to 100,000 are we going to be asking those folks to pay more? Seems like exactly yeah. you don't want to make pay more. It'll make sense. It'll make sense later. It'll make sense on the... Two okay. slides from now. I'm totally going to say it's like Okay. Also, <laughs> some group that pays more. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's that's everybody else. But I'm asking yeah. a philosophical. Okay. So we shouldn't pay much. Yeah. So. Okay. <laughs> Great. I hope that's clear later, but I will look into it if it isn't. Okay. Um, Thanks. We'll come right. back to chart two after chart four and see if. Okay. We need it. All right. So going on to chart three. Um, this is just showing you the difference in the, in the median bill in those categories, which is pretty much what you gathered from looking at the other one, except that it's, the difference is, it looks like a perfectly straight line when you're looking at as a percent of income. When you actually look at the median bill, then you start to see, um, you know, how the bills are going up. Um, and so you see a lot of places where the purple bar is much higher than the red bar. Um, and so I think it's sort of important to zero in on uh, where the population is. And since most of the population is in the lower income categories, look at, take a closer look at uh, that on chart four. Okay, and this is just showing you the same household income categories, but current, current law is the red line and the resident education tax is the purple line. And it's showing you the median tax bill and it's in, in smaller increments. So it's $25,000 increments so that you can see a bit more about where the discrepancies are. 
So Deb, it's the lines swap. It looks like at around 75 and then swap back again. Red is current law. Yes. Yes. And then swap back again at 100. Can you talk us through that a little bit? Um, yeah, I, I guess I would say their current law is lower below um, 50,000 income. And that's mainly because, um, well, a couple of things, but one is replacing the circuit breaker with a ramp down. So there aren't those steps and that there isn't that cut point at 47,000. It, it just uh, is more gradual. Um, also, using AGI instead of household income means that household income uh, that we use now adds things in to it that are not in AGI. Like for example, disability insurance, things like that are added in so that AGI is lower than household income at the low end where you have those kinds of additions to household income. Um, and then I would say that they're basically the same. There are data um, anomalies, but they're very, very close until 90,000. And you know that at 90,000, that's where you suddenly in current law have a cap on your house site value. So since most people at 90,000 have a house site value that's slightly higher than that cap, they're paying based on income plus that excess amount in their house, house site value. So that's why the red line is higher starting at 90,000. And then by about two, 200 to 25, it starts going the other way. That's the point at which um, the resident income tax would be higher on average than current property. It, at, that, at that point, it's just property. You're not paying on income under current law. That, um, that little dip that's right there 75. on 75, what, what that is, is people that are eligible for the, in, the credit, however, their, 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 their uh, calculated property tax is greater yes. than their calculated income tax. And so they pay the property. Yeah. And that's what that's, so they're eligible, but they're not getting anything because of their property value. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that, it's, it's slight, but it's, that's what it is. It's, yeah. So, all right. So then, wait. Yep. Go ahead. Hi, hi, Deb. You may remember way back a long time ago, um, before I was on this committee, and there was a, a proposed income tax for education. Um, one of the things that the committee stumbled on, um, Bud Otterman being a prominent voice, was capping whether or not to cap the um, income tax part of this proposal at a, at a certain, you know, um, at, a, at a certain high income level. And, and I don't know if we want to go that way or not, but someone's going to ask us in the committee or outside of the committee, and I think we should at least be prepared to discuss it. So I'm just throwing that out on the table, Deb. <coughs> Deb, do you have um, well, something you've modeled? Um, that often comes up. And um, I ran these for um, not having a cap on income. Um, I did at one point run it with a million dollar cap on income just for curiosity. Um, and also you'll see later, I, maybe I can save it for the very last slide, but um, thinking there's also a question about volatility in high incomes. Um, and so there were sort of two reasons to think about capping it. But the model, the stuff that I'm going to show you now is not capped. But it, it, you're right, it 
that's a discussion that always comes up as soon as anyone talks about this. Um, yeah. Even the uh, just on, on the other hand, Deb, did you consider or think about uh, a more progressive structure rather than a, essentially there's a once you get over 50, it's a flat tax. Um, it, well, the tax structure commission debated that for a really long time and um, thought simplicity um, outweighed uh, going to brackets. And part of the reason for that was we wanted to maintain local control. If we maintain local control and then had brackets, it gets a lot more complicated. Um, so anyway, the, the short answer to that is that the Tax Structure Commission talked about that quite a bit and opted for simplicity. And so in this modeling that I'm doing, it's, it's a flat tax. Thanks. I was going to ask the same um, question, and then I just lost my, I had a second question, and I forgot it, sorry. <laughs> no. So okay, we're re ready to move on to the fifth? We're ready for you, yeah. Okay, so um, I had a few charts in here just to show the shares of filers, the shares of <laughs> of taxes raised um, to see sort of a, a sense of are people paying their first share? That's really the question that comes up a lot. So, yeah. sorry, I, I'm sorry, I remembered my question. Um, okay. it, has, it has to do with all of the modeling. Um, I, I think I understand that what you used for the modeling was household income because that's what we have. And I'm wondering what happens in the translation from household income to AGI in terms of tax rates and various other things, because they are different. Um, and they're different partly because of the number of people you count in, in the household. So anyway, I just wonder if you can help us with that. Um. And maybe, maybe you did use AGI in some of this. It, it's, yeah, uh, the, the, higher, the higher incomes are pretty much AGI because people don't fill that in. And right. the, there's a pretty good link um, between AGI and household income after, I don't know, maybe 100,000 income. Um, but below that, because of the diff all the different things that you have to add into household income, it's it's much more variable. And because um, well, you've seen the form. It's a very error prone yeah. form. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. So there are some of the when you get in and look at the data household by household, and maybe I should say the AGI is is by household also. Um, to the extent that the people are identified in the form um, that's sent in. And so for joint filers, of course you get it, but um, you're also asked to talk to file other people in the household. So we've gotten those linked by span. So can I get yeah. clarification on that? So if you had an, uh, if you, you're a married couple and you have an adult child living in your home, you're including the AGA for all three of them? In, in this this model, is, is that what I thought heard you say? Yes, it's based. You're on not say, doing it by filing status. You're doing it by some some something that's sort of in between uh, AGI and household income. Right. We're taking that declaration form, and that has the um, SSN of other people in the household, and then. Uh, tax department linked that into this, the correct span. Uh, it's not perfect. Um, and house, so that first there's the household declaration where you have to actually claim the right people, same as we do now. Um, but then once that happened, the tax department was able to uh, locate that other filer's information. 
So I guess I'm trying to understand why you didn't use the construct that you use of over 100,000. Why didn't you use that same construct below 100,000? Uh, let's see. So we have household income. It's a, that complicated form that's filled out by people who want to claim the credit now. And so if their household income is greater than, or if their income is greater than 135,000, um, generally they don't fill out that form. So we don't know their household income. We do know the AGI for everyone who's filed an income tax. So, and so I'm wondering why we wouldn't just use AGI to model this across the board. Okay, so I thought about doing that and it makes current law look crazy because of the mismatch between AGI and <clears throat> household income at the low end. So I decided to go the other way, which makes, whichever you use on the X axis makes the other one look less sensible. <laughs> but anyway, I decided to go the other way um, because household income is what we know now, what we're using now. So it's what people will understand. Um, and most of the people are within the income category where they have filed that. George. But I thought part of the reason to do this was to get rid of that complicated um, difficult household income form for people. I thought that was part right. of the to, to mm -hmm. the uh, um, AGI for everybody. It, it definitely is. But the only reason I'm using it for comparison is because that's what we have now. That's our starting point. Um, I do have some charts afterwards to show you how this works with AGI. And of course, it looks great. <laughs> um, but these are more to show you how it's comparing with current law, okay? Um, so chart five is just showing you. So, so one more. Uh, I'm sorry, maybe I misunderstood. I, I thought the proposal, I thought I heard you say that the proposal, the, this bill out there or whatever, is to link those AGIs in a household. But is that what you, is that what you said? Because so, or is that just what you're using for the modeling? That's just what I'm using for the modeling. Got it. It would be AGI. <laughs> yes. I'm glad you asked. No you don't form. have to add them together. Yeah. So, <laughs> okay. So, right. Part of the problem is comparing with something that's very complicated now and figuring out the fairest way to do the comparison. Um, so, Deb, can I try to summarize what I hear you saying? And you can please correct me. So, in order for us to understand how this concept on the table would compare to current law and sort of people's experiences of current law, you wanted to have something of an apples to apples. So you tried to construct something that looked like household income rather than AGI for the purposes of comparing the two. But the proposal on the table and the actual impact in people's lives is on, would be AGI and just AGI. And, and so just we're filers. Later, right. And just filers. Just whoever files. Yes. Right. And so yeah. we'll then look, um, and it'll be individual filers that sort of experience the individual impact. And we'll be looking at charts of that in a little bit. Yeah. Great. Okay. Okay. So chart five is just showing you where the people are. Okay. And this is to help us figure out how we're shifting, like who's paying and who isn't. And you can see that even though the charts show those really high purple bars going way off to the right, you can see that there aren't very many people way off to the right, okay? Um, chart six is showing you what people are raising, essentially, in those income categories. How much, what share of the total household education tax is being raised by those different categories? The red bar is current law, the purple bar would be what would how it would change under the resident education tax. So you can see that in current law, households with incomes less than 250,000 in aggregate pay more than 85% of the to total household education taxes raised and that would drop 
under the resident education tax, they would pay only about 75% of the total. Can you pause for a minute there? That's yep. the way of thinking about that is taking my brain a minute and maybe other people's brains a minute. And another way of looking at the same thing is in chart seven, which is trying to overlay um, those two charts, the two previous charts. So you see the, the gray bars in the background are showing you the, the households as a percent of total. You can see where they are. And then the lines, the two lines are showing you the percent of the total education taxes, house-side education taxes paid by under, but paid by the income category. So the red line is showing you um, the percentage of the total house-side education taxes paid by each income category under current law. And then the blue or purple line is showing you how it would change under the resident education tax. Carol? It's so, so high, the purple piece on the residential education and a million and more. Is that, did you take a snapshot in time of you know, people, are people selling their businesses and that's where you get so much income tax there? It's 100,000 or more, Carol. I thought it was right. a million at the far end. Yeah. So, well, I should point out, it looks like it jumps way <clears throat> up at the far end, but basically the chart would have to go way, way out to the right if you kept those same increments of $50,000. So it really, I compressed them all into one category, but basically it would be a line with a very, very, very long tail that goes way out. Meaning there's the purple bar. <clears throat> Then what would it just say? What that line with a long tail means? Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not envisioning it. What would it, the picture of it look like? Very, very, very small, but goes all the way along. Is that what you mean? Yeah, very, very few people. Like a lot of increments with no people in them, uh -huh. and then a few people way at the end. But I, I think the question is the number of households that fit into that. It, it, somewhat, right. that I'm thinking, what, yes. So if the table, if, if this chart was sort of had the same categories as you went out, for, if it went out sort of to infinity instead of putting all of the final categories into one, are you saying that it wouldn't go up at the end? It would just stay flat on forever? Um. Yeah, essentially, they're going to be paying the same percentage of a very high income at the very end. Um, but this, what this does point out when we're looking at the shares is that people making more than a million dollars will pay um, much more under uh, the residential education tax than they're currently paying. Thanks, Carol. Yeah, you know, I just um, I'm thinking of a farmer with a land or a family business who decides to sell in a year, and they almost have to become a resident of another state so that they didn't get hit with an income tax. Income tax, and then well, just I'd like to hear about that. Just what what happens in that case? Um. Okay, maybe, can we hold that until we get to the, yeah. the last chart, which we're getting to the high income person and the volatility question? I think it fits in with that. Thank you. Sure. David has a question. Um, yeah, just before we leave chart seven, Deb, uh, I just had a, a moment to look at that before we went back to chart six. So on chart seven, the... 50 to 100 income category, just as an example here, so I'd be sure I understand this. 
they represent 40% of households and under current law are paying 30% of the total and under, under the proposal that you've modeled, it would be 27%, yeah. something like that. Okay. Yeah. And, then the, and then for the next group, it's a lower percentage. Okay, good, thank you. Um, is there, I'm flipping through, but not finding it. Is there a chart that shows the number of households in each category? Because I, the, the percentages are helpful and interesting, but it, I, to me, it makes sense. It would be helpful to know how many households we're talking about. 220 households? Total, and then what's the distribution along the income line? Okay. I so total number of households by income category? Yeah, so you've got great charts showing increases yeah. and decreases in percentages, but not the aggregate number. I'm just curious what the numbers are in each category. Yeah, okay. Um, I, I can do that. Um, I have a harder time doing the aggregate numbers just because I pulled together um, three different databases and, and I had to get a match on all three before I can use them. So it ends up not being the total. <laughs> um, I had Jake Feldman but, calculate that for me before he, he can do that. Okay. Okay. Right. And you've got you've got the share, you've got the share of total yeah. households in each in for, for something it's one category I can do the totals. Okay. Share and figuring out what the number is. So okay. the share is five tenths of a percent. How many Households is that? Yeah, it's the a big, big yeah. spreadsheet. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, you, it, yeah. you just want a number for each yeah. of those income categories. Okay. I would also wonder are those, and this gets to where I was, I'm trying to figure out something. It, um, are the, the 220, are they always, are they often changing? How, how steady are those actual households? Those 220 households that that, that you um, always the same, or is is a half of that the sale of a, a business or something? That's what I'm also interested. in. The volatility question. Sorry. Not only of the yes, in a way. Yeah. Okay. Um, Deb, one last, one second, sorry. Caleb, I don't, um, I just want to make sure you know how to raise your hand and you um, are good over there. And so if you're not, feel free to text me or Sorsha. Yeah, I can only ask him to unmute. I okay. can't actually unmute him. Okay, so. great. So Caleb, if you need anything, we, we see you there. And I just want to make sure you don't get lost because I, I find participating by phone really challenging. So I just wanted to offer that up. Deb, back to you. Okay, um, moving on to the next two charts together, eight and nine. Oh, sorry. Okay. No, I just want to know which oh, Okay, are. eight and nine, great. Okay, so chart eight is, I've changed now um, what we're comparing this to and we're comparing it to the share of AGI. Okay, so We've got the, the height of the bar is the um, share of the total adjust, household adjusted gross income in the state of, of homeowners. Um, and then the purple line is showing you the share of that, um, the share of the total education taxes raised based on the share of the AGI. And you can see it's a perfect fit because that's the design of the program. Okay, and then nine is showing you the same thing, but adding in a line for current law. So it's showing you the shift in terms of, as a percentage of AGI um, between current law and the resident education tax. Does that make sense? I hope. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
It does. We are nodding, though you can't see us. Okay. Um, 10 is just a, a list showing you the number of people, um, the share of the households, basically, that would see higher and lower bills and what the median difference would be. And you can see there's a lot of movement. You know, the lines make it look as though, um, you know, it's pretty smooth. But in reality, there's a lot of um, movement back and forth. And you can clearly see the pattern that the residential education tax would be higher as your income goes up. Um, but in the lower categories, there are plus and minuses. Um, a lot of it has to do with the difference between AGI and household income, you know, how that's calculated or... Um, Deb, I have a very basic question. Median decrease and median increase, are those dollars? Yes. Yes, sorry. Yes. And that's where, and, yeah. and this is where, again, it would be nice to, to know how, how many households are going to see an increase and how many households are going to see a decrease in each income category. It's kind of surprising that even at the lowest number, there's a significant number that will have it. I mean, there's a significant increase for some people. Yeah. Even at the lowest income level. Yeah. Depending on, their, on, their, on what they're spending, basically what we're. $200 would yeah. be a median increase for less than 50,000 who have an increase. Median decrease would be more than that, but. Yeah, I think yeah. you're absolutely yeah. right. How many? But if there's only th if there's only three people in the increase category, and there's five hundred in the other, that's going to tell a different story. It just doesn't. I, I don't get a picture yeah. of not knowing the number of households. Well, you do have the share of the ha total households in each of those categories, so that you know that two hundred to two hundred and fifty, um, the bill is going to be lower, but it's only one percent of the population. You know, so you, you can get a sense that way. Okay. And so I can, okay. Yeah, sorry, David. Uh, maybe you're going to spend a little more time on this, Deb, but I, I guess I, I have two questions, one for the under 50 and one for the 50 to 100 uh, income categories. Uh, for the under 50, I, I'm just confused because they are currently treated differently and it sounded like they would still be treated differently uh, until that 50,000 mark. But, but I, I guess then once you get over 50, I'm also confused about why, can you explain why there are people who would see an increase here um, just conceptually? Um, I know you know. <laughs> Let's see. Well, the re I the reasons that I can think of is that there's um, a difference between their AGI and their household income, and it's between what the tax department shows as the AGI of the people in the household and what was reported on the household income form. Um, okay. It's that's the biggest thing that I can find. Um, it feels very counterintuitive. Um, George, do you have a? Oh, well, yeah, just want to make sure I'm reading this right. Yet. <laughs> if we took the share of total households and added up all those percentages of those homes, that would be 100%. Yeah, so there's 49% and 51% in the, each column. <laughs> so it totals so that, up to 100%, so that, yes. That would say that more people in the 50 to 100 range will have an increase in their taxes, then we'll have a decrease. Right. And that shows on the other charts. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Scott. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that points to that, that blip that Emily yeah. noticed. That's Those are people that are, they don't have high income, but they have high income relative to their property value. Mm -hmm. That's who that is. Okay. Yep. I think and, you're right. Yeah. And so they're paying their property right. now. At the other end, you got some people having a decrease but with over a million dollars of income. It's kind of it's surprising. 
that person has a massive house. Can <laughs> <laughs> you say that one more time? At the other end, the, the, the million dollar plus, you've got you know, some people getting a reduction yeah. in their taxes. That person has one big. Let's go find that massive. single person in their single house. And take a castle. <laughs> yeah. 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 David, did you have something? Oh, sir, did I uh, have a shadow hand uh, in my mind? Well, maybe maybe the same logic applies to the under fifty thousand in income. Just why that group also has half, almost half of the households would see an, an increase. Is it because they're paying right now based on their home value, property value? Not at that income level. Yeah. I, I, so is it is it a function? Is this sensitive to district spending in some way? Is that um, what might be going on here? No. I mean, I don't think that's part of the model. No, it wouldn't be. Yeah, no, I don't think that's it. Um, there, there is a, another piece in here. Um, under forty-seven thousand, we have that fifteen thousand dollar exemption, and if people take that. Um, rather than paying on income, it must mean that they have a very low house value and they've just subtracted 15,000. So, and that would be the better deal for them. So, um, so it, it's the same thing that Representative Beck said, but a, a, an added twist is the $15,000 exemption on top of that. So, so how low would know. How low would someone's house site value have to be to have that work in the under 50? Um, I don't know. I mean, okay. I, I'd have to, uh, I realize I should go through and try to characterize why the people are in these different categories. I, I did run some statistics on it and found that the correlation um, was the, the biggest explainer in terms of just playing the data and not data errors and differences in, in AGI versus household income, the biggest explainer was the ratio of household income to house site value. Mm -hmm. Okay, that would make you shift from one to the other. Um, but I will try to look at this more carefully to figure out what are that, you know, sort of categorize what are the reasons. You do have some weird things that happen down here. It things like where people will will take all their income out of some fund for three years, and then for yeah. you know they're showing no income for a number. I mean, there are some there are some strange things that happen down in this right. area. Mm -hmm. yeah. But again, it, knowing the numbers helps because you can yeah. explain away some. Yes, so that way, yeah. but you can't explain away a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. All right, so I know that what you wanted to do is figure out how this fits into your um, discussion and you know how this would work in an individual town. And I think that was Representative Odie's question before, you know, how does this look in a, at a town level? And so in the very first chart, we showed that everybody within the, in a district would have the same percentage of their adjusted gross income going into this. Um, the very first chart on the very first page, you mean? Yeah. When we were talking uh, about the yields? The okay. very first page. Okay. Okay. So, so we know that. Um, and then we know that it would differ from one district to another district depending on the spending per pupil. Okay. Just as it does now. And so the change really happens within groups. Um, with, within income categories in a single district where they all have the same um, rate as a percentage of income, but it will change their bills differently. So chart 11 is an actual town um, and the rate goes up very slightly, like 2% um, over the current, 3%, I think it is. Um, and it just shows you what's happening in, to different taxpayers in different income categories within that district. 
Yeah. Yeah. So um, the other models that we looked at assume that spending is the same everywhere. They're not sensitive to spending decisions. This is this is the first chart that we've looked at that attempts to link uh, local spending decisions to the tax impact. Is that right? Well, the very first chart was, the very first. Yeah, was showing you that. Yes. Everything same. else was looking at the averages. Yeah. Every, everybody spends the same. Um, exactly. So exactly. to really understand impacts, you'd have to you'd you'd want to you'd want to connect them to mm -hmm. actual spend. This what Carol is getting at. You'd mm -hmm. want to connect it to actual spending in a district and um, see how that rolls out. Right. Um, but pretty much, uh, it it would be the same in any district. Um, because both your current spending would be higher in a high spending district and your spending well, will it be the same. So um, your distribution of households is different mm -hmm. district by yeah. district. Yeah. And, the, so, and I, I would add, when I think about the distribution of households district to district, I think one thing that could happen a lot district to district is the mix of folks who have higher incomes and low property values and people right. with the inverse of that and high high and yes. low yes. you've got yes. all those yes. things right. every one of them tells the story mm -hmm. that's right yeah. that's when, right when jake, when jake runs that chart i've seen it yeah there's a whole lot of people whose house value is two to three times their income exactly. that's your middle class right. and then you got the outliers yeah. <laughs> and there aren't very many of them but there are enough of them that you got to take they distort at. the pictures they do yeah. they do yeah that's right. And so that's exactly what was that that ratio was exactly what was the biggest um, determinant of where you see changes. Um, is that ratio of house height to um, income. And so, you know, I think that in terms of what you're looking at with weighting, you're looking at essentially adjusting tax capacity by but for each district, from district to district. And what this is doing is looking at adjusting tax capacity essentially at the individual level within the district. So in a sense, it's, it's determining your individual tax capacity based on your AGI and the tax capacity of that district um, depends on its AGI and its spending per pupil. So it's more individual changes rather than affecting your, the way you're defining tax capacity by rates. That wouldn't change, um, but within a district, it would change for individuals. Okay, thank Does that you. makes sense. Okay, so uh, I mean, I guess the bottom line is that high spenders will be high spenders. Um, the yield is very similar to where we are now. Um, so that essentially uh, the tax capacity, the way you define it by your rates wouldn't be different um, district to district. Within a district, there would it would be changed um, because it would be based on the adjusted gross income of people rather than the combination of the property value and adjusted gross income. And so the last two charts are um, about this high income people and that gets to uh, the volatility question and also to representative Masson's question about uh, should we cap the income somewhere? And I, I think that um, what you have in the very high income categories, you have a lot of uh, sort of one-time events, um, selling a business, something like that. People may be in that category one year, not in that category any other year because they just had that huge capital gain. Um, and so it's a big volatility question, particularly for the income tax, um, personal income tax. And, but I think there is a difference between taxing 
that high income category under this kind of a system and, and doing it under the personal income tax. One is that the personal income tax is bracketed. And so if you have a capital gain that in one year, um, it would push you into a higher bracket. And so it would make, people have often said, but you know, I think this should be averaged over 20 years because it's been, you know, something I've been building for 20 years or whatever. Um, and then they would presumably pay a lower rate um, if they paid out over 20 years. In this case, there's just one rate. It's not bracketed. So it doesn't make any difference whether that came in in one year, or whether it came in, in in 10 increments over 10 years. Um, another is that the income tax is considered volatile um, in terms of we set our budgets and we don't know what the income tax is going to bring in uh, to meet that budget by the end of the year. Uh, the property tax is considered less volatile because we set a rate to meet the budget. Um, and so in this case, for the resident education tax, we would do the same thing. We would set the yield in order to meet the budget rather than just keeping the yield constant and then having to hope that it brought in the amount that we estimated. Um, a third thing is that we would use, we would base this on your prior year's income. In other words, right now at this time of the year when you're filing your income tax, that would be the same income that would you, you would use when you went to your school meeting to figure out what you're gonna pay in school taxes next year. Um, so while we haven't um, tallied up all of the 2021 AGI yet, we do know um, whether there's been a pandemic or not. Um, you know, we, it's, it's not a complete unknown as to what happened economically, so we can make a much better estimate on it. Um, and the third thing is that we would have a stabilization reserve. Um, but anyway, the two charts are just showing you what the total AGI was um, from 2011 to 2020. And the second, oops, sorry, there are two 12s. Anyway, the second 12 is showing you um, <clears throat> what difference it would make if you capped it at 1 million. So you took off the most volatile portion. Yep, I don't, I guess I do. I'm trying to overlay the two in my mind to see the differences. Um, Why did this cap it? Why is it different? Oh, I see. There must be more volatile. Got it. Okay. I, I need Carol, it. do you? Again. No, this is what you were waiting this, for. So do you have? Yeah, can, I just need that explained one. Just what I'm looking at. I get the words, but I don't see it, how it translates to this picture. Can you explain the capping again? Or a little bit more, Deb? Explain which part? how you capped it and what it did when you capped it. Oh, okay. So basically, I, if your AGI was over a million, um, we didn't count it. Essentially, we counted your AGI up to $1 million. And the amount of that was not, ex was not included. All right, so in each year, we knocked out um, we didn't, if somebody had a, an AGI of say $5 million, we didn't, um, we didn't knock the person out of the picture. We just knocked the extra 4 million out. Oh my God, but, but I'm looking at things that say 20 million. So I, I don't understand. 20, $20. <laughs> it's... Oh, 
Yes, thank it's, you. No, 20 billion. Or something. It's 20 billion is the aggregate AGI. Yeah, right. And if oh. you look at this, this is each year what happens when you knock it out. It right. took me a minute to figure that out. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> All this tells me is there's more volatility in the income that's over a million dollars. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Which I think yeah. that's we, what we've known, but that's yes. a nice structure. Yeah. That's yeah. a concern. Yeah. Also, yeah. volatility is approaching a million. Sure. Yeah. Um, I think. I think coming back. Yeah. Um, I think we need to wrap up, especially to give some time for. I believe two of our members are being nominated at the joint session. Oh, yeah. Is that true? Oh. Who's that? David. <laughs> well, is that at 10.30, not 10.15? Oh, but I don't, it's 10.30. Okay. We don't, and I don't oh, okay. think we need I to do anything except mind. show up. So, oh, good. Yeah. Okay, great. So, <laughs> I'm so glad because I had a show up to clear victory. So, I have time. Cool as a key. I feel like Ways and Means is really going to get famous today. Um, <laughs> so, we do. I'm sorry. We do have a couple more minutes. Does anyone, um, we've been through, anyone have any questions about these two people? Carol? It's just, I'm wondering. How taxpayers in, I get that it's driven by local spending, that what the <clears> amount, <throat> be, but how it looks for a tax, could a taxpayer making a certain income in one town with the same spending have a higher income tax than a person in, in another town with the same spending based on what what the housing looks like in those two places. That's what I'm wondering. But whether they're winners and losers, you know, the, the, the different, the comparison between current law and this proposal will look different in different towns, depending on that. But once it's in place, it's going to be exactly the same. Same income, same rates. Same if, if the, the transition will, will look different. Same income, same rates, same tax. Yes. So, But there might be a, a, one town might have more property value, so those people might be their difference from the current law to where they end up will be different from a town that has right. Right. less expensive houses. Yeah. So the transition yeah. may be bumpier or maybe smoother, depending on what the current yeah. circumstances are. Yeah. But that's not it's not the size of the school budget from school to school; it's the size of the ed spending from school to school. That would make the rate different. Change, different. Yes. 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 Well, so the ed's, the if, but, but yeah. it's also the relationship between income and property value. In that yes. Account. At least to get going. Oh, and I'm saying once, just you're getting going. Yeah. and I'm yeah. saying once this happens and if, you know, say 10 years out, everything's in place, every district with the same ed spending and the same income would have the same, would be paying the same, every person in all those places would be paying the same. But that doesn't mean that if two districts could have two different budgets and the same ed spending. So just like today, ed spending is what drives the tax rate. Not the, budgets. Budget. It's spending so, per pupil. Per pupil. Yes. <laughs> We're <laughs> equal as <laughs> people. <laughs> or maybe we won't have equal. Well, for depends. Us, depends. depends. So let us not. For us, <laughs> let us not assume we will. <laughs> for unintended consequences, what what could the what would people start moving around from, you know? Well, I, I'm finding a little, I'm, I'm I'm just asked wondering. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. So uh, the question that I keep trying to uh, one of the questions I keep sort of muddling through, but I haven't figured I haven't figured out what the right question is, is whether we're really confident that we can allocate the income to the right district. Um, and I, I'm not sure why that seems challenging to me, but I'm, but we're not, I, I'm living callous, but, and my property is in callous, but I'm not used to thinking of my income as being callous income. And I understand that it is. So I'm just trying to, I'm trying to think if there's a challenge there and if there is what it is. And I just, it, because it's a whole new concept, we've never, um, we've done household income, but it's rooted in a house. Mm -hmm. um, and so anyway, I just raise it because I've just never, I've never felt entirely confident huh. in how that's going to work. Well, because people have incomes from very different kinds of um, 
situations and they also move around a lot. Um, particularly if you're talking about renters, it gets to be more time to move more than once a year. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but then if they do move, how does the, if, the, if, they, if I got, if I lived in Calais and for half the year and Montpelier for the other half of the year, where does my state house salary get allocated for the purpose of figuring out which tax rate I pay on? I guess maybe it's a simple way to ask the question. Well, right. Deb, do you want to try to answer that? Well, there needs to be a rule around it. Yeah, there needs to be a rule around it, but it seems like yeah. a rule is possible. I mean, we have a rule right now for which, for where but you how, pay property tax. But how right? complicated, it, well, yes. but it's yeah. entirely rooted in the property. Yes. And we know where the property is. Yes. Could you repeat that? Again? No, because it oh, was, uh, well, I could try. <laughs> <laughs> it would be a different sentence. Uh, no, well, so I, I own a house in Calais. Mm -hmm. I work, I get my legislative income, or whatever income I have, not income I earn in Calais. Um, and then halfway through the year, I sell my house in Calais or third of the way through the year. And then I move to Montpelier and Montpelier and Calais have very different spending for equalized pupil. So which rate do you apply to my income? Do you apply a blended rate or do you apply the where I lived on April 1st mm -hmm. um, or April 15th, which is a filing deadline or sort of what is it? And, and given that, what happens to those decisions? Because they, they might start to matter. Mm -hmm. I guess. Thank so, you. Yeah. Um, I'm less concerned about that, Janet, who I certainly get your question, as I am about looking at chart nine <clears throat> people in the bottom two lists. Someone's tax is going to go up fifteen to thirty thousand dollars, whether some of those people might go to Florida some of the time anyway, will declare residency out of state. And I wonder how that figures. I mean, we've certainly in years past had former tax commissioner um run through a bunch of analysis, whether we agree or not, on, on people leaving, you know, moving out of state. Um, and I, um, as, as we understood in the past, um, uh, there are very few ta taxpayers in very high categories, but they pay a substantial amount of both income tax, state treasury, and would pay a substantial amount of, of this tax. So I'm, um, <clears throat> need to arm ourselves with the best information we can get in order to understand the repercussions, I guess we could say. <laughs> and, and it could be that the consequences of being a resident or uh, not being a resident would be that much higher mm -hmm. um, and how you use your property and whether you rent it out and so on and what those rates are. But I'm curious, Deb, do you have an answer to the question I asked about how you decide which tax rate applies? Um, I, I think our, our thinking was that it, you come down to make a, a, a rule um, that you are a resident based on a certain time period and that the bill is set after town meeting and it has to be paid. And so if you move um, to Montpelier, in the middle of the year, you still have to, your original full bill has to be paid. If you want to work out something out with um, somebody's moving into your house and they're going to pay some of the, the your property tax bill, your that, that court, yeah. you can work that out. Sure. But basically right. the full amount of the bill has to be paid and you're responsible for it unless you've um, made arrangements with somebody buying your house. And it's based on the previous year's income because yeah. that's not all we know. So yeah. it's always so going to be. It, it's a known entity. And, you know, I think that you're right about um, it's a change. And, but we've sort of gone halfway there by um, filing your household income um, and having a homestead declaration. And basically, we don't have that piece with the renters. But at least we are, um, we have gotten some of the way by um, our current system of making you file your homestead declaration. I, I guess if I could just 
reflect on that for a bit. So the current system is rooted in a house, which has a fixed location. Mm -hmm. um, yeah other than the trailers that we're going to talk about someday, probably. But, um, but the, if I'm a taxpayer and um, I've moved, I've long ago given up on Callus and I've been in Montpelier for nine months or whatever mm -hmm. it is, and now I am going to pay, let's say Callus is a very high spender. Um, now I'm going to pay a tax bill that supports the Callus schools and it's a year plus since I've lived there. Um, and I just, I'm just trying to think about explaining that to people and um, sort of how, how that gets uh, received and understood by people. I, um, we're done. And we have to, we have to wrap, but I will. Um, I think Deb used the phrase a education, a residential education tax, I think. And that's how I, I've been sort of imagining it is that it's sort of it's that rooted in the residential ness. Yeah. And so I think of it similar to how the property tax sort of roots someone in a spot at a point in time. Um, and this is just the way income is just the mode that we used to calculate it. It's not that um, it doesn't sort of travel to where where your bank account or your income might be. But we should stop and take a break and go to the floor and nominate our two wonderful Ways and Means members to be trustees, and thank you.